Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. My name is Matt. We're one church in multiple locations. I want to say good morning and welcome to our Lesby camp. I mean, our Leonardtown campus. Can we get the lights on? Maybe it was the lights. Lights up. There we go. Can we wave to our Lesby campus? Our Lesby campus is over there meeting in Lesby. Hey, Lesby. We're so glad. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? I was going to say, we are the 11 o'clock service, so we should be fired up. We should have had some coffee and sugar. I saw some of you walking in and not offering me any, so thank you for that. I appreciate that. Hey, anyway, I'm pretty excited. We're going to start a brand new series called, I Want to Believe in God, But. And over the next several weeks, we're going to ask some pretty tough questions that if we were honest, not just people who don't believe in God, but that all of us should have. And here's why. Because listen, faith is never blind. Jesus never asked for blind faith. When you walk into the church, you don't have to check your brains at the door. I believe some of these questions that we're going to ask are questions that we all ask and that I believe that we can actually investigate them. And faith is not a lack of looking at those questions, but in actuality will help strengthen our faith. And here's the reason that answering or looking at these four questions, which is why is there suffering and evil in the world? Um, you know, what about the Bible? What's up with this hell thing? And what about other religions? Uh, the reason that answering those questions is so important is because I don't know if you know this, but surveys tell us that in America, in America, 80 to 90 percent of Americans say they believe in God. And the reason that answering those four questions is so important is because if you ask those 80 or 90 percent people of what God looked like, people would give you a bunch of different images or pictures of what God looked like. And if we were honest, it's really difficult to see God for who he actually is and, and see him clearly. And the reason why it's difficult is, listen, because you and I, we go through life and we have these experiences in life. And as we go through these experiences in life, uh, they kind of bend how we see. They kind of bias our view towards the world and towards God. I mean, if we were all honest, life has happened to us and life has happened around us. And when life happens to us and life happens around us, sometimes we'll have this fog or this haze and our, our picture, our image of God really isn't clear. It's kind of fuzzy. And on top of it, it gets worse. Sometimes there's jaded people who, who kind of spew out their bias and that even furthers our misconceptions. It makes a fuzzy picture even less clear. And so our hope in answering these four questions over the next several weeks is so that you and I can maybe remove some of that, that haze or that fog. Because if we are really honest, listen, as you and I go through life and life happens to us or life happens around us, the reality is that sometimes sadness or hurt or frustration or anger or bitterness or disappointment will bend or warp our view of God. And so what we need to do is go, listen, how can I see him clearly and objectively? And so over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at these questions. Now, here's the thing we have to do. Before we even dive in, we have to address something that all of you already know, but we rarely ever say out loud. And here's the thing. All four of these questions are emotionally loaded subjects. I mean, these subjects are like powder kegs. As soon as you talk about them, the emotions just come out from inside of us, and they just overwhelm us. And listen, Research has repeatedly told us this fact is that when you and I become overwhelmed with emotion, that it impedes or blocks our critical thinking or us thinking clearly. Now, does that make emotions bad? No. Emotions are good and emotions are valid and emotions are real. But what we have to do is we have to be aware that sometimes when our emotions come up, we have to ask the question, am I responding based on emotion or am I being um, uh, responding based on rationale? And here's the great news, that there's room for both. So over the next several weeks, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me. <coughs> Again, pardon me. We want to ask a pretty important question, which is, listen, there's room for both. Let's just make sure that we're aware of it. Now, listen, our first question, I believe in God, but what about suffering and evil, might be the most emotional question of the four. It comes with a lot of emotion. Matter of fact, surveys tell us that a majority of people who don't believe in God, their number one question is, why is there suffering and evil in the world? Matter of fact, this week, as I was thinking about this message early in the week, I kind of shared on Facebook that like if I could just ask God one question, my one question would be about some suffering or some evil that I've experienced in my life. And so I asked some of my friends on Facebook, would they be willing to share? Listen, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? 
And so the, these are pretty real and they're pretty raw. So I just want to emotionally prepare you uh, that some of the questions that people would ask God were, I think, very genuine. I would ask, why is there childhood cancer? I would ask God, why did you take my sister? And then only four weeks later, my dad passed away. I would ask God, God, if you stitch me together in my mother's womb, why did you allow me to be born gay and then never be able to love someone the way others are allowed? Why could my earthly father not show me the love and affection I so badly needed and craved? Why do we have so much hatred and racism in the world? Why did I have to suffer through a broken marriage for 25 years? Why was I abused by my dad? Why did I have to have such a traumatic delivery and suffer with depression? If God can do anything, then why won't God heal me? Why did I miscarry three times? Why did my mom abandon me at an early age? And I bet every single person either watching or listening or out in the audience probably has a question like that. Why God? And to those who answered on Facebook and to those in the audience, I just want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your pain. I'm sorry for the hurt. And I need to be upfront and honest as we kind of dive into this question is, is that I don't have a complete answer. That the few answers we do have are somewhat incomplete. And the fact that we have incomplete answers aren't because there aren't answers. It's because if we were really honest as human beings, me, you, we as human beings, if we are really honest, we, we have a limited view of time and space. We have a, a limited view of wisdom. We have a, a limited view of wisdom. The reality is, is we can't see all ends. Now, as a pastor, I have the honor and to serve people during funerals and to visit them in hospitals and have meals with them as they struggle through difficult things. And this is where I need to speak to, to everyone. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you to kind of, you know, look up and kind of lean in a little bit because I see something that happens regularly and it, it happens with well-meaning people and it's well-meaning people say really bad things. I mean, I, I've literally been at a funeral for a child and heard someone said, oh, God must have needed another angel. And I, and I just wanted to go, no, if God needed another angel, he would have created another angel. That's, that's not what God wanted. I've, I've been in hospital rooms where people are sick and people go, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I go, that's not in the Bible. Stop it. Like, like that doesn't help. I've seen people deal with, with just brokenness and abuse and, and had people make statements like, there's always a reason for everything. And I go, that's the most horrible thing you could say in the moment. Please stop. I've heard people say in very difficult situations, it'll be okay. And I want to just go, can you really deliver that? Because when people experience trauma and suffering, it's okay not to be okay. And so I just, I just want to say, hey, people, if we don't know what to say, let's just not say things that, that hurt people. Because listen, I want to just speak very plain. Listen, I've read the Bible for the last 30 years, almost daily, I've, written, I've read the Bible from front to back multiple times, and, and I just want to clear up a few things here. I just want to go, I've read the Bible from front to back, and never once have I seen it be God's desire that a parent would lose a child. I've read the Bible from front to back, and I've never seen it be that God's desire that a child would lose a parent. I've read the Bible from front to back, and I've never seen it be God's desire that a person would be betrayed or abandoned by their spouse. I've read the Bible from front to back, and I've never seen it be God's desire that a a child or a woman or a man would have their innocence robbed from them. I've read the Bible from front to back, and I've never seen it be God's desire that a person's life be drained by disease. I've read the Bible from front to back, and I've never seen it be God's desire that someone be in an abusive and harmful relationship. I've read the Bible from front to back, and I've never ever seen it be God's desire that someone suffer under oppression and injustice. Matter of fact, you know what happens all the time I read the Bible? Is what breaks our heart breaks God's heart. And for anyone in pain, and anyone who's suffered, it breaks the heart of God. And so I don't have a complete answer, and I won't have all the answers. And I want to encourage you to be careful of anybody who says they have all the answers. 
But our incomplete answer to suffering evil leads to a truth that you've experienced, I've experienced, and we experienced. As a matter of fact, it's in your, your opening thing. You're going to find it here. It's going to be the second one. Sorry, back there. We're going to move to the kind of the opening thing in there and keep going. Next one. Keep going. Thank you. At some point, all of us will have one why God question. Matter of fact, on the back of the insert, I left space for you to ask your one why God question. See, if you've lived enough life, if you go through life enough, so all of us will experience evil. All of us will experience brokenness. All of us will experience life as it isn't, shouldn't, it, it shouldn't be. At some point, we're all going to have one why God question. And if we are really honest, this is the biggest question that keep people from believing in God. Matter of fact, often when people say, listen, I don't believe in a good God. And the reason I don't believe in a good God is because I look around and I see all this evil and the suffering, which is kind of an oxymoron. It's kind of a logical fallacy. And here's what I mean, is if you can look around the world and identify that there's some evil, then there's some standard of good that we can all agree on. Listen, people since the beginning of time on every continent, on every language, and on every skin color, and every economic understands that kids shouldn't die of starvation. That people shouldn't be oppressed because of the color of their skin. Little five-year-old girls shouldn't be rescued from brothels. All people can agree that there's some ought-tos that are wrong, and it points to that there is a right that there is that is beyond us. So in some sense, when you ask this question and say, I can't believe in God because of the evil and suffering, you are already acknowledging that there is a moral authority above ourselves. But it leads us to, this, to these two statements that I often hear people who go, I don't know if I can believe in God. And it goes something like this, and we're going to put it up on the screen. It said, if God were all powerful, he could eliminate suffering. You know, the reason I don't believe in God is because if there was a God and he was truly God, he would be all powerful. And he must not be all powerful because there's suffering. And you go, well, what if he allows suffering? What if he is all powerful and he allows suffering? They go, oh, great. I'm glad you asked that because if God was loving, he would eliminate suffering. And because they're suffering, then God is unloving. And so they go, listen, if God isn't all powerful and he's not really God, so I'm not going to follow him. And if God could get rid of it, he would. And so listen, since he doesn't, he's not loving. That's not the God I want to follow. And I often go, man, that, that, that seems fair until you look at the two things. And I ask this question off the time. I go, are those really the only two options? Are you telling me that the complexity of evil and suffering in our world can be boiled down to a multiple choice question with only two answers? What if those weren't the only two answers? Is it possible that there is something beyond this in the complexity of suffering and evil? And most people will acknowledge it. And it leaves you and I still with a very tough question. Matter of fact, maybe one of the most toughest questions that we'll ever ask in our lifetime. And I'm going to put it up here on the screen. It says this. It said, if God can and God cares, then why is there suffering? If God can and God cares, then why is there suffering? And here's the amazing thing this morning. Did you know that every generation since the beginning of time, people have been addressing this question? Matter of fact, ever since Jesus showed up on the earth, ever after, ever since he rose from the dead, generations of people have been asking questions and writing books. Listen, go to the library. Go, go on to the Google. You can find tons of books on, is God good? Why is there suffering and evil? Because people have been wrestling with this in every generation, on every continent. Matter of fact, God knew we would wrestle with this. Matter of fact, Jesus himself got confronted with this very issue. We see it in the eyewitness account of Matthew. And, and we're going to start off and we're going to put it on the screen. It says, when John, and I'm going to stop here, this is John the Baptist. Now, I need to give you a little bit of a backstory about John the Baptist. John the Baptist showed up on the scene before Jesus did his public ministry. And Jesus went around to the Israelite people and he said, listen, Israelite people, God picked you to be a people that shows the rest of the world about him. But instead, you've made life all about you. And like, you've really just become somewhat selfish. And you really need to turn from being selfish and turn to God and love him and, and, and live life right. And they called him John the Baptist because he would baptize people. Matter of fact, John the Baptist is the one who pointed to Jesus, and he said to the first couple of disciples of Jesus, look, there's the Messiah, the Christ, the one who's going to save the world. You should go follow him. Matter of fact, a little bit later, Jesus comes back to John, and Jesus says, John, will you baptize me? And John says to him, listen, you're the Messiah. I shouldn't baptize you. You should baptize me. And Jesus says, let it be. John was there when the Holy Spirit descended from heaven. He heard the voice of God said, this is my beloved son. This is John the Baptist speaking. But John the Baptist 
got thrown into prison because he stood for truth. And he was in a messy, smelly, horrible dungeon and was probably going to lose his life and, matter of fact, did lose his life. But before he did, this is where we pick it up. And it says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, Jesus, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Oh, stop, stop, whoa. John, you're the one that called the Messiah. John, you're the one that baptized him. John, you're the one that pointed disciples to him. Why are you asking Jesus if he's the Messiah? You already know the answer to the question. You said he was the Messiah. You have to understand, John sent his disciples to Jesus because he was in prison, and he was saying to Jesus, hey, Jesus, your boy John here. Remember I gave you some disciples? Remember I helped you with the baptism? Remember I've been pointing people to God? I'm here in prison. And if you're the Messiah, you need to come rescue me. You need to get me out of this suffering. He was waiting to see what Jesus would respond. Listen, come on, I've been for you. I can't believe you're going to let me suffer in prison. And Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus is going around fixing all the things that lead to suffering. And he goes on to say, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. If I was John, I'd be like, what kind, can we just all admit, if you were John, what kind of answer would that be? Blessed are anyone who doesn't, I'm in prison, they're going to cut my head off. I don't want to hear, blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. And here we have one of Jesus' most devout followers who's suffering, kind of throwing suffering right into Jesus' face and saying, Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Because here I am stuck in prison about to get my head chopped off. And here's what I love about the Bible. It never sugarcoats anything. It just says it like it is. And Jesus is confronted with the issue of suffering and evil in the world. So this morning, I, just, I want to make three brief observations. And again, I, I want to be careful because they're, they're, they're not complete observations. They're just, they're just pieces. And so here's what I've discovered. Answers never alleviate pain. That's why we shouldn't give answers at funerals or when people are in the hospital or when they're sharing their brokenness. Answers don't alleviate pain. Comfort is given when we are caring and compassionate in our friendship. And so here's what I want to do. Here's observation number one. If you want to write it down and you're following along, it says, it is logically impossible to have free will and no possible of moral evil. It's logically impossible to have free will and no possibility of moral evil. And here's why. Because you know what we love in America? What's the number thing we love in America? And it's not baseball. Freedom. We love, that's all we talk about in America. Freedom fries, freedom this. I want my freedom. I should be free to do this. In America, we love our freedom. We like our freedom. We want our freedom. Matter of fact, we think all people should have freedom, don't we? I mean, that's kind of the American thing, right? That people should have the ability to freely choose how they live their lives, right? We call that freedom. But here's the problem. If you have free will and no possibility of moral evil, that is logically impossible. I mean, really what happens is, is we understand this for love. Listen, listen. For genuine love to be love, it requires a choice. Forced love is not love. All of us desire and think dignity comes from the ability to choose. But when you and I have the ability to choose, we have the ability to choose right, and we have the ability to choose to do. <clears throat> I, like how, I like how one pastor said it. His name's Andy Stanley. He said, if you're ever talking to somebody about suffering and evil, he said, ask him this question. If you had a button... And if you could push the button, the button would get rid of all bad. Would you push the button? And the person would start going. You go, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Before you push the get rid of all the bad button. Uh, just a quick question. Have, have you ever done anything bad? Because if you have, as soon as you push the button, you're going to be gone. Do, do you have a brother or sister? Because if you have a brother or sister, did they ever do anything bad when they were little? Or are they ever going to do something bad when they grow up? I mean, have, have they ever been mad? Because when you push the button, they're going to be gone. Oh, and your mama and your daddy, like before they got married, before they met you and told you all the good stories, did they ever do anything bad? By the way, do you have any children? Are your children going to do anything bad? Like, are they going to do something bad in the future? Because as soon as you hit that button, you're going to get rid of them. 
And I want to ask the question, is it possible that you wouldn't hit that button? Because you know that to get rid of bad means you have to get rid of? Because it's logically impossible to have free will beings who can love God, but with no possibility of moral evil. And this is where, this is where it gets a little bit hard. Listen, listen I'm just going to be honest, okay? I'm going to tell you a little bit honest about me. This is a little bit honest about you. And we, like, no one's going to like this, but it's true. Listen, we're hypocrites. And here's what I mean by that. See, we want free will, but then we want none of the consequences of having the privilege of free will. Right? We want the, we want the dignity and the privilege of free will. We just want God to erase all the consequences of free will. But that's not how free will works. Free will works where it says that if you have the ability to choose, that we can choose, and sometimes we choose wrongly. Sometimes we choose poorly. And if we're really honest, sometimes we choose evil. And it creates harm in the world. And we're all yelling at God, hit the button. Hit the get rid of the bad button, God. But if God hit the button of get rid of all the bad, guess how many people would be left? Zero. Now, here's the thing. In the midst of your pain, you don't care about this, and I get it. Pain is pain, and when you're hurting and in pain, it hurts. But the reality is to have free will means that there's the possibility of evil and wrong. Which leads me directly into observation number two, which is this, is delayed justice doesn't mean deny justice. Delayed justice doesn't mean deny justice. And here's what I mean. I'm going to give you kind of, kind of an example from, from back in the day. I don't know about you. When I first moved here into St. Mary's, uh, there wasn't much here. Anybody remember back, you know, 20 years ago? There wasn't a lot here, okay? And so I would often go up into the Waldorf area, or go up into the northern area to, like, go shopping, go to the mall, do some things. And now a lot of stuff is here, so I don't have to do that. But I don't know about you. On long drives, I tend to, like, sometimes forget that my foot is heavy and it pushes the gas pedal and, and that, that little speedometer thing goes past what it's supposed to. And I'm pretty sure, you know, I was on my way to Waldorf, and, and I was going, and I was going fast because as a follower of Jesus, I obey all the rules and wasn't at the time. And so I was driving and I was probably speaking and there's this light kind of in the middle of nowhere. There's some soccer fields off to the side and this little, this little like gas station <coughs> and the light turned yellow. Now, when you get to a light that's yellow, two of, you know, most of us have two responses. For you safe rule followers, it's like, always hit the brake, always hit the brake. It's yellow, yellow means stop, ah, right? And then there's other of us who go, if I hit the gas, can I make it? Let me just see how far I can go. I happen to fall on the second crew, which is if it's yellow, that's orange, which means go faster, which is not true. And if you're a driver, please don't do that. If it's yellow, just hit the brakes, okay? But on this day, I decided I would try to beat the light. It was yellow, so I hit the gas, and I was racing towards it. And the reality is, is I didn't make it. I mean, as I got to the light, it just turned bright red. I knew I was wrong. I blew right through the intersection, just blazing fast. And what's the first thing you do when you run a red light? You're looking, all, like, you're looking all around, right? You're like, you're like is, is, am I going to get pulled over? So I was looking to see if there were any cops or any, you know, any sirens. Was there, because I, I would have earned the ticket. I, I broke the law. I would have earned it. I was guilty. Um, this was me being wrong. But I looked around, and there was, there was, there was no, no, no police, no sirens, no tickets. And I was like, whoo! And I just smiled, and I kept on rolling. Yay! And I thought, this man, I got away with it. I was awesome. And about two weeks later, yeah, those of you from this area know what I'm talking about. Apparently, I didn't know, but this light apparently gets passed by, through a lot of red lights, and they had put a traffic cam on there. And there was my car license and a picture of me, like, smiling, gunning it, you know, breaking the law with a big old fine on it. Now, had you been at that stop sign or that red light when I blew through it, you'd have been like, man, how irresponsible. What if someone with kids had been coming through and you hit them? Like, you're a bad person. I can't believe. I wish there was a cop here to arrest. That's injustice. I can't believe you got away with it. But I didn't get away with it. I wasn't denied justice. It was just. Matter of fact, I like what the scripture in Revelation says. It says this. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. I mean, isn't that amazing? The whole concept about humanity and God is that God wants to be with us and wants us to be with him. I mean, when you boil it down, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. And he will wipe away every tear. Hey, listen, 
Some of you have cried some real tears and some legitimate tears. I had someone tell me after the first service, yeah, I have a friend, they lost an 18 month old and it was the second child that they've lost. There are genuine tears, there are painful tears, there are tears with no answers. But there'll be a day where he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death. Death will not reign over life because it wasn't supposed to. There'll be no more sorrow or crying or pain for all these things will be gone forever. See, the reality is, is just because we're in the midst of pain and there's injustice and there's evil doesn't mean that God is not going to give justice. It's just delayed. It is coming. There will be a time where everyone will stand before the creator and give an account and we'll stand there by our own merits or by the merits of Jesus and I'm choosing the merits of Jesus because that's the only way we make it is through the merits of Jesus. And there'll be a time that every wrong and everything that has caused pain will be made right. Every broken heart will be healed. There'll be a time where all is made right. But here's the funny thing. We always want justice, don't we? Except when it comes to one person. Who's the one person we never want justice for? Who? See, the reality is, is when someone hurts us, someone does something wrong, someone offends our sensibilities, we want, a, we want the hammer. Man, God, lightning bolt. God, big foot out of the sky, crush them. God, get them. See, again, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm trying to be honest. Aren't we hypocrites? We want justice for people who do wrong until it's us who does wrong, and then we want God's mercy. We want grace. So you want justice for everyone else and mercy for ourselves. Do we, do we see the hypocrisy in that? What if delayed justice isn't about God's inability to bring justice? What if God's delaying is about his grace and his patience, hoping that many people would turn to him? But just because there's delayed justice doesn't mean there's denied justice. I mean, that is the great news. That justice is coming. Someday it will all be made right. And I know in the midst of your pain, it doesn't take away the pain, but it can provide hope in the midst of the pain that it will not last forever and it will be healed. Which leads me to kind of my third observation. Again, not all the answers, some incomplete, but God's response to suffering is shocking. I mean, what God does about suffering is so shocking that it's offensive to some. I want to kind of give you an example. I want to kind of story tell something that I think is a great example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, there used to be this chief. He was kind of a king of his tribe. And, and this chief or this king of his tribe, uh, they lived in kind of an agrarian culture where they had herds and they had cattle and they grew. And it was one of those places you always see in movies where there's fields and there's dogs and there's animals and it's beautiful. But this year had been a pretty difficult year. There had been a drought in the summer, and winter had come early, and winter was very severe, and there wasn't enough food or resources for people to make it all the way through the winter as they normally did. So they had to ration the food so that people could survive until the springtime. The problem is, is people were greedy, and they started stealing the reserves of the food. And the elders came to the king and the chief and said, listen, if you don't decree a harsh punishment, thieves will eat all the food and the people will die. So the king or the chief makes an edict, says, listen, if you are caught stealing, we're going to bring you in front of the whole community and we're going to put up a pole and we're going to beat you within one lash of your death so that no one will steal the food so that we can all make it. Well, for about a week, no one stole food. But the second week, there was some food missing and they couldn't catch the person. So they set a trap and the third week, they caught the thief. And people were cheering and mocking and there was this, this person in a, in a cloak that they had captured and they brought it before the king and, and they pulled the cloak off the king and the thief with his mother. And the king, the, the, the chief was stuck. He goes, if I beat my mother, she's so old she'll die. Who would follow a king that would beat his own mother? But there was another issue. If the king didn't bring justice to his mother and let her stole and, and, and possibly put everyone else's life in death, he wouldn't be a just king and no one would follow him because he seemed unjust. And it seemed like the question that we were stuck with in the beginning, if God can and God cares, why is there suffering? And so the whole community is standing around waiting to see what this chief will do. How will he get out 
of this situation. And what he does is shocking. He says, tomorrow in the morning, she will be whipped. People gasp. I don't know if he'll do it. Will he do it? And they go to sleep, and people can't sleep, and the king can't sleep. In the morning, they bring out the mother, and they, they strap her to this pole. And the king says, let the beating begin. And the man who's muscle-bound has this huge whip, is about to whip her, and he says, wait a second. And he takes off his kingly robe and his shirt, and he wraps his arms around his mother and then says, let the beating begin. You see, what God did to suffering is shocking. God stepped into a messy and busted and broken world, and he suffered just like you and me. God put on a human suit, and he suffered the worst that this world has to offer. We pick it up in Matthew. It's three afternoon. Jesus is on the cross, and they've They've crucified him. They've whipped him. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Hebrew that I can't speak, and it says, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cries out to his heavenly Father the same thing that you and I cry out when we experience pain. Where are you? I mean, think about what Jesus suffered. He was rejected by his own people. He was abandoned by the disciples who he loved. He was betrayed by his friend Judas. He was slandered by people when all he had done was good. He was, had injustice. He was unjustly charged, yet he was tortured. He was hung on a cross, and he was murdered. God's answer to suffering wasn't to push the button. God's answer to suffering was not to allow injustice to continue forever and call bad things good. God's answer to suffering and evil is so shopping, shocking that some people go, God shouldn't do that and would never do that. Yet Jesus showed up and he suffered. He suffered like me and you. When you cry out and go, God, don't you understand? He goes, yes, I do. You see, here's the thing. That question of why is really beyond our pay grade. So God doesn't try to answer the why question, but God does answer a different question. And I need you to lean in. I need you to, I need you to hear this. God doesn't answer the why, but God does answer the how much he loves you. As Jesus spread out his arms and as they nailed him, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You want to know how much God loves you? He showed up in a human suit and experienced all the worst suffering and evil this world has. And he has joined us in our pain. What kind of God does that? He answers the how much I love you question. And sometimes in our pain, that's all we have to hold on to. If you're watching this or if you're here today and you're in the midst of some pain, I don't have all the answers for the why. But I do know how much God loves you. That for the only time in eternity, the God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were separated. And God took on the sin of the world, mine and yours, as an answering to suffering. This leads me to the conclusion. Put it up on the screen. Jesus, not church, not politics, not religion, not a building, and not a pastor, but a person named Jesus. Jesus is God's personal response to our personal pain. Because here's what I discovered. Suffering and evil out there never really bothers us. We go, I'll pray for them. I'll pray for them. We should do something. Oh, we should, like, suffering and pain and evil out there is always out there. But as soon as we experience pain and suffering in our own life, it becomes very real. Is that true? Suffering is always personal because it creates pain in our lives. Jesus personally suffered pain and joined you and I. Because for eternity, you and I can look at the cross. You and I can look at the cross and not our circumstances and know that God answered not the why question, but the how much he loves you question. Because anyone that would die for you is for you. I was thinking about how to close this. 
Think about it. Jesus. His disciples knew he was the Messiah. They had seen all the things that he had done. And they were hoping that he would step into this world and he'd hit the button. He's going to stop it all. He's going to fix it. And then suffering happened to Jesus. Betrayal, abandonment, slander, torture, injustice, and death. And not a single disciple would have said, yup, all those things are going to lead to something good. And here's the thing about suffering. Suffering is never the end of the story. Because in five weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. And regardless of what you believe, the history, the historical record proves that the tomb is empty. And see, Suffering and evil don't get the final say in Jesus' story. And because suffering and evil don't get the final say in Jesus' story, I got the best news ever. Evil and suffering and pain will not have the final say in your story because it's not finished. Here's the great news. Wherever you are in your life, your life isn't finished. Life isn't even over in death. There is something called eternity. And so this version of life that you're in that has pain and evil and suffering is not the final version. See, for those of us in the midst of genuine pain and genuine hurt can have hope that the suffering and the evil that tried to define Jesus that could not, we have that same Jesus. And it will not define us because our story isn't finished. And so while I don't have a why answer, I do have a how much God loves you answer. But there's a God who stepped into our pain and our suffering to be with us. Who allowed suffering and evil to happen to him so that it wouldn't have to define our life. Let me pray. God, I am stunned. You could have easily just said, not my problem, and hit the get evil, bad, gone button. You could have turned the other way, but that would have been justice. And I can't imagine how you came up with a solution to step into our suffering, to allow suffering and evil to happen to you. But you conquered it, so it does not define us. God, thank you that we don't earn our way into a relationship with you. It's by what Jesus did. And the things that happen in this world break your heart. And that's why you died on a cross, so they would not have to define us forever, that this version isn't the final version, and that we can have hope found in a person named Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.